<sighs> Good morning. Good morning. And peace to you. Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Roseville, First Church, where we do our best to live into the gospel message of love as a community that is committed to offering hope to this world. This is a day that God has made, therefore, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Indeed, today is a good day. Because today is a day that God has prepared for us to share. And it's also good because it just so happens to be Mother's Day. Amen? Amen. So raise your hand if you are a mother. (laughs) Raise your hand. Keep them up. Raise your hand if you mothered someone. Even if it's not your child. Okay? Raise your hand if you have a mother. Okay? Raise your hand if you've been mothered. You see all the hands? So that's why this day is so important, amen? (laughs) Real quick, um, a little history. Um, This holiday was born from a very, let's call her a very spunky woman in the earliest 20th century named Anna Jarvis. She was a Methodist woman and activist from West Virginia whose dogged advocacy led to the national holiday of Mother's Day in 1911. Further, after dedicating the whole first part of her life fighting for Mother's Day to become a national holiday, she ironically spent the remainder of her days resisting the over-commercialization of the holiday by the greeting card industry and others. Mother's Day for Jarvis was to be this holy day, not just a holiday, amen? Um, And I could see definitely the deeper truth that inspired her passion. Now, some mothers this morning were greeted with flowers, but Mother's Day should never be simply reduced to cards, balloons, or even beautiful roses that were plucked from one's own garden. Uh, Mother's Day is is an acknowledgement that we cannot get to anywhere in life without someone taking the time to mother us. Even in imperfect ways. And even from people who are not our quote unquote biological parents. And so I am rejoicing today and I am being glad in it. And I celebrate our coming together and gathering this morning. At this time, I invite you to stand if you are able as Dave Seacrest comes forward and leads us in our time of worship. We gather together to worship our loving and nurturing God who, like a mother, knows us intimately, loves us unconditionally, teaches us the way we should go, and comforts us in times of need. We gather to celebrate the source and sustainer of our lives who, in the example of mothers, guides us in the way we should go. Come, let us worship God who is always faithful. Amen. 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 Amen.
Our scripture today comes from the ninth chapter in the book of Acts, verses 36 to 43. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name was Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please, come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. And seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, in these brief moments, I pray that you will open our hearts, that we may receive that which you have for us to receive. And as always, may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable. In thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So once again, I say to you, Happy Mother's Day. I have written about this before. But the concept of a mothering, the giving and nurturing of life itself, is probably the nearest living metaphor of who and what God is as a creator and a sustainer. There is something powerful about what the theologians describe as the divine feminine. Obviously, this something <laughs> is not always honored, and we live in uh, all too sexist world and patriarchal world. We know that women are fighting for their rights that are being threatened day by day. But however, at least for today, women and mothers in particular are rightly celebrated. And throughout history, mothers and women in general have been those who have been the lifeblood and the heartbeat and the protectors and the curators and the carriers of our deepest held values, passing them down like seed planters from one generation on to the next. I think of the prayers that my mother, Alice Louise Pumphrey Evans, who you see right here in this picture, think about the prayers that she prayed by my and my brother's bedside every night. I remember the quiet ways and the not so quiet ways that my mother modeled a life of faith so that when we got older, we will not depart from what was poured into us. This legacy of faith extends beyond my mother. Those of you who know me know that I always say that I am a product of the legacy of my mother's 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 faith. So in that spirit, I want to acknowledge my father's mother, Mabel Randall Evans, and especially my grandmother, Mary Ford Humphrey who you see, she passed a few years ago, just short of living 100 years on this earth. In fact, she was born just a few months before our own precious Hazel, who is still with us at 103. But my grandmother, she was a slight woman with soft eyes and an easy smile. She was a woman with a slow gait and very arthritic hands. Hands that were kind of gnarled and worn, but bore the witness of a life selflessly lived, committed to service and love and just helping out folk. She, like many women before her and many women after, have been a true reflection of the beauty and divinity of God and have been the moral force within our families, within our society, and in movements of change going all the way back to the first 
first century church up to the civil rights movements. Unfortunately, their story hasn't always been told, right? That is why I love the story about Tabitha, even though Peter gets top billing in the passage. And though you know how much I love Peter, right? Yeah. Peter being, I'm, my birth name is Peter. I'm named after him. I, I cape for Peter. Peter's my man. But if you look at it, this story is more about Tabitha and how her life has meaning even now, even today. And so just for a little context, the book of Acts is seen as a continuation of the gospel of Luke. And it's sometimes referred to as Luke Acts, as it is presumed that they were written by the same author. This passage begins by identifying Tabitha by both her Aramaic name and her Greek name Dorcas. This tells me that Luke is seeking to reach this wide audience of people, both the common folk who spoke Aramaic in the village and the more Hellenized populations who spoke Greek in the more urban centers. He wanted everyone to know about this incredible woman named Tabitha. Now, Luke does not hesitate to say why we should know about Tabitha, Luke or the, the author. In one translation, it says her life, Tabitha's life, overflowed with good works and compassionate acts on behalf of those in need. She lived in this port city of Joppa, which is located near the modern day city of Tel Aviv in Israel. But she was saintly. She was well known. Her reputation was impeccable. And she made an indelible impact on those who were, as Jesus once said, the least of these in society. Because of this, it must have caused incredible shock waves when Tabitha suddenly took ill and died. So though they prepared the body as they were supposed to, the people could not fathom what they would do without her. This led them to send for Peter. They wanted him to come, come quickly because they knew he was just a few towns away in Lydda. When Peter arrived to this upper room where Tabitha's body had been laying, he encounters this large and loud group of women crying and wailing. And they showed Peter the, cloth, the clothing and all the items that Tabitha had made for them while she was still alive. Of course, this is where Peter goes into action. Tells the woman to leave, right? So they left. Kneels down by Tabitha, prays for her, and dramatically says, get up. And miraculously, she opens her eyes and rises up with Peter's help. He then presents her to the people, including the previously inconsolable, but I am sure now overjoyed women. And the news spread all throughout Joppa, and many people were amazed and believed. How's that sound? So though I know that this healing miracle by Peter is the headline, I want to invite the company of women back into the room. The women who were crying for Tabitha back in the day, right? She, in their implied story, I believe that there's another miracle that is just as worthy as what Peter did. Scripture says that they were widows, which meant it was likely that society did not always have a place for them, and they did not always have a place to belong. Yes, they benefited from Tabitha's generosity, but the intensity of their hurt and their insistence on the possibility of a miracle indicates that Tabitha was not some distant benefactor who was disconnected from her giving. In fact, some scholars speculate that though Tabitha probably had some means, had some money, she may have been a widow herself. Therefore, it's not a, strength, a stretch to suppose that there was a real empathetic connection, a sense of belonging and a genuine love between Tabitha and these other women. And so these women gathered, literally wearing the evidence of Tabitha's goodness on their body, proudly wearing the clothing that was stitched together by Tabitha's very own hands. 
I imagine that when she made these items, she welcomed these marginalized women into her home. I imagine that they sat down together and gathered around her feet. I imagine that these women told their stories as Tabitha Hand stayed busy on the stitch. I imagine the widowed women offered the bits of their stories like scraps of tattered clothes, clothes that Tabitha then put, to create, put together to create something new, like the offering of her listening ear to the fragmented stories of those women's pain. Can imagine having that Tabitha had these hands that were gnarled and worn from years of stitching and listening and offering wisdom while they gathered at her feet. In the same way, I imagine that centuries later, African-American women will pass on their knowledge in a similar way in a tradition that was called mother wit. I don't know if you heard of this, but Zora Neale Hurston and others described mother wit as the collective folk wisdom of black women that was passed on from generation to generation. It was a transferal of knowledge that occurred in organic exchanges, like sharing the genesis of Nana's recipes in the kitchen with friends, or giving advice while a mother is doing her daughter's hair while that daughter is propped in between those mother's legs, <laughs> or sharing stories while gathered to sew, stitch made cloth, homemade cloth and clothing. Listen. This is who Tabitha was to these women. She was a sister, a mother, and a true friend. Further, it was striking to see the biblical image of these widowed women mourning Tabitha's death gathered around her body while wearing the same handmade clothing that was stitched when they once gathered around Tabitha when she was still alive. It made me think of quilting circles. Right? You see some of the evidence of those who are involved in that here and other sacred places that women have created. You know, speaking of quilting, again, in the African American tradition, stitched quilts were often kept as heirlooms that were passed down from generation to generation. Often during slavery, African American women gathered whatever scraps of materials they could get their hands on, whether used clothes or maybe even a discarded sack. Nothing was wasted. And with intricate care, these women created quilts that met the survival needs of a people. A few years ago, I asked my mother about this tradition, and she spoke of her grandmother. Miss Mariah Ford is her name. She told me how her grandmother would make these elaborate quilts and how the fabric sometimes would extend and stretch all the way down the narrow hallway. My mother remember how she used to see her grandmother stitch the pieces hand by hand. She also saw that these pieces were created from, and this is her words, the good parts out of the worn out clothes. For my mom, her grandmother's quilts were a thing of magic, each squared piece offering a story from the person who once wore the fabric. Often the patchwork of mismatched materials conveyed multiple generations worth of stories, keeping warm the legacies of families within its expert stitching. And this is the lesson that I want to leave with you on this Mother's Day. A lesson found in Tabitha's legacy, stitched into scriptural history that we just heard. And a lesson embodied in the living tradition of women quilters from long ago. New life is available to us, but only if we are willing to take seriously what my own mother said, to cut out the good from the parts that have been worn out, which means being willing to release our attachments to certain things that are no longer life-giving in order to be free to make space in our lives for the creation of something new. So let me get real with you. Let me bring this home a little bit more because this thing that I'm talking about is not always easy. 
In our personal lives, far too often, we get accustomed to our worn clothes, and though they be rags, they be familiar rags. We know that certain relationships that we are engaged in are not healthy and is worn out, but we stay attached. We know that certain places or jobs or people we allow into our orbit no longer support our highest good and is worn out, but we sometimes still stay attached. We know that certain stories that we tell about ourselves, that I am not good enough, that I am unworthy of happiness and joy, that I am defined by my perceived failures or defined by what has happened to me or defined by what has been said about me by other people or defined by the hurt that has been afflicted on me by those who were supposed to love me. That all those things are nothing but worn out thought rags that do not support our spiritual health or striving. And yet, though we know those rags are worn out, we stay attached sometimes for fear of not knowing who we will be if we released it. But let me tell you, like our great mothers who quilted before, God wastes nothing. And, and, and we are loved by a God with a mother's love, a love that is unconditional and abundant. There's a divine grace that precedes us and is able to redeem even the ugly parts of our lives such that we can be metaphorically gathered up around Tabitha's feet as we begin to cut out the good from the parts that have been worn out. This message is also applicable to the church community. As we have found during the pandemic, the mission of the church is not just the mere maintenance of brick and mortar. It is to be as an Alma Woodsy Thomas painting a place of resurrection. This church should be a place of life that ensures that those who are sick and those who are on society's margin have a place to go where they can feel accepted. This church should be a place of life where all people, regardless of race and gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or just station in life, can be gathered up and feel equally welcomed and dignified in a place in a space where one can both get all their needs met and join a community where they can tap into their heart's commitment to serve others. It should be a place of life, especially in a time when one only needs to turn on the TV or check their social media feeds to know that we are in a moment of great uncertainty and angst. Y'all feel it. And in a world where numerous refugees are fleeing from war-torn regions like Ukraine, and concerns from all across the globe are ending up right here in our neighborhoods, we need to channel Tabitha's spirit. In a world where immigrants live fear-filled lives and are guilty for nothing but wanting to provide for their families, we need to channel Tabitha's spirit. In a world where people do die for lack of access to health care, where children still do drink tainted water, and where it is perversely normal in some communities to hear the piercing, popping death sounds of gun violence. We need to channel Tabitha's spirit. Her story moves us to live in the getup that Peter said, and to be enlivened by resurrection powder, power in order to meet the needs of those in our communities whoever and wherever they may be. Indeed, we are called to bind up the bruises of the body and soothe the unseen wounds of the heart. We are called to gather in those whose shadows darken our threshold and follow Jesus' gospel to give drink to those who thirst and food to those who hunger and to visit those who are imprisoned. We are called to strap on the Samaritan's sandals, right? And not only care for those who have been left on the Jericho Road of life, but to fight for the systemic social change that eradicates the conditions that made the Jericho Road so dangerous in the first place. We know these things, 
And we have done these things here at First Church. However, we will not be able to sustainably do this work if we do not continuously do what my mother said. Cut out the good from the parts that have been worn out. Indeed, this is true for the church and true for our individual personal lives. You must never allow fear to leave us bound to worn things, things that no longer serve us, things that leave us on a type of deathbed. Why? Because the gift this morning is knowing that God can gather us up and we can live enthused, renewed, and energized by God's vibrant life. Oh, here in Roseville this morning, we are far away in time and space from my man, the Apostle Peter, performing miracles in that upper room in the ancient city of Joppa. But the spirit of Tabitha still lives on in us whenever we trust in God's love, get up in the power of the resurrection, and commit to leaving a stitched legacy of faith and goodness in this world. Like carefully stitched quilts passed on through generations, my prayer today is that God will continue to bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. And like our great mothers before us, may we be rooted in knowing the greatness of God's faithfulness. Oh, morning by morning, new mercies we see for all that we have needed. Thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. 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 Those who've just stood, I want to invite you forward since you're halfway here. Come on up. Okay, Ruth Ann, can you stand and tell the people what this, this is? It is a prayer shawl. And every stitch, when I talk about it, I say every stitch has been done with love and prayer. And when you wear it or cover up with it, you're surrounded by prayer. All right. So these are hand, hand stitched prayer shawls. But who do they go to? Whoever requests it. And who are the types of people we've given it to? Um, all kinds of people who are ill, people who have lost loved ones, um, you know, mourners, ill people. Um, we have lots of people who request them for their friends and relatives. So we, we have this ministry, and it also goes to um, folks who um, presently are experienced, you know, who might may be unhoused at this time. So anybody who comes into this sphere. So what we're going to do is that we're going to bless these prayer shawls. Say with me, may God's grace be upon these shawls, warming, comforting, and enfolding, and embracing. May these mantles be a safe haven, a sacred place of charity and well-being, sustaining and embracing in good times as well as difficult ones. May the ones who receive these shawls be cradled in God's hope, graced with peace, and wrapped in the love of Jesus Christ. Blessed be. Let's say that blessed be a part. I see an exclamation point. One, two, three. Blessed be. There it is. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.
So as we prepare to leave, here is the, the benediction or the good word, right? That I want to leave with you on this Mother's Day. Um, for those of you who don't know, the name Tabitha or Dorcas is translated in the Greek as gazelle. And gazelles are swift-footed and responsive and energetic and graceful and darting and quick and bounding with life. Knowing that God wastes nothing, I pray that we will be guided to fashion a vision for something new for our lives. A quilted creation that is infused with bounding a new life that blesses us, but also blesses everyone that we come in contact with. Amen? Amen. And as we close, I want to um, I turn our attention to Kawami, my wife, who will say a prayer for mothers. A prayer for mothers. We send this prayer to the moms who are struggling, to those filled with incandescent joy, to moms who are remembering children who have died and pregnancies that have miscarried, to those who carried their children full term, to the moms who decided other parents were the best choice for their babies, to the moms who adopted those kids and loved them fiercely. To those experiencing frustration or desperation and infertility. To those who knew they never wanted kids and the ways they have contributed to our shared world. Including those who mothered colleagues, mentees, neighborhood kids, and anyone who just needed it. To those remembering moms no longer with us. To those whose moms' memories live on as a blessing. To those moving forward from moms who did not show love or those hurt because they regret they did not care for their moms more. Today is a day to honor the unyielding love and care for others we call motherhood, wherever we have found it and in whatever ways we have found to cultivate it within ourselves. Blessings be to all moms. Amen. 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 With gratitude and the assurance of peace, we now sing. And now may you go with God and may you go in God's peace. Amen.